What I'd like to do now is move on to a second data set, which is um, the other one I referenced that has 69 subjects, where we're only looking at chromosome 19. And here we're starting from more of a blank slate where we're going to run some of these filters interactively. So to begin with, let's go ahead and jump in and take a close look at the data. I'll zoom out here to the whole chromosome view. So again, the density of the data here is such that we may not really see what is going on. One thing I'd like to point out is that over here along the left, we have a grouping variable applied that tells us the population that each of these subjects comes from, and these are the HapMap population assignments. We could also, if we wanted, group by a different variable. So we have one in here that just tells us if our subjects are European or not European. So we see these green ones down here are the European group. And everything has been resorted. And you can use any grouping variable you like to resort the rows of the variant map. We can zoom in a little bit closer and start to see some interesting patterns in the data. For example, we can see here some variants. Let me zoom back out just a little bit more. You'll notice there's a lot more white space down in this European group than there is up above. That's largely due to the fact that the human reference from which variants are called is based more on Europeans than other populations. But we can also find instances of common deletion events, such as right here. This turns out to be about a five base deletion that is very common across all of our subjects. We can also zoom back out and find common, this is an insertion event, where a number of our subjects have a single A base that is inserted just prior to the C. The way they're drawn in our variant map is that if it's an insertion, it has the dotted line around it, and it's presumed to be between these two is where that is inserted. Now, if you are concerned that perhaps there is a uh, different SNV behind that, so maybe this C is turned into something else, you can always turn off the insertions to see if there's something behind but there's not in this case. So we'll go ahead and um, move back to our data set. So here we have our complete set of variant calls where we have 69 subjects, just over a half million. Now if I wanted to follow a similar workflow to what was done in that other project with the TRIO, I can start by applying any number of filters, but to begin with, I'm going to apply a simple region membership filter. And I'm going to subset just to the markers that are in or near a gene. So I'm going to use the RefSeq gene annotations. And I'll include nearby markers, so up to 1,000 base pairs in either direction. So here, what's happening? is that the program is scanning through my half million variants and it quickly identified which were inside those gene regions, which were not, and it removed about half of them as being outside of genes. So I can now subset that, and I'm down to just under 300,000. Now perhaps as a next step, I could apply a filter to identify which of these are common based on the dbSNP database. So again, from my select menu, filter by annotation, this time I'm going to use a probe track filter. A probe track is any annotation track that has information about a single nucleotide position. So I will use my common SNP track from dbSNP 132. And again, this track contains SNPs that are known to have a frequency of at least 1%. And I'll, ina <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll inactivate the markers that are present in that track and only if the uh, alternate allele is the same as what I'm observing. So this one will take just a little bit longer to run. Uh, 
And again, what it is doing is it's taking that common SNP probe track and comparing each position in my spreadsheet, all 293,000 of them, to that track to determine whether or not any of my observed variants should be considered common. And this looks like it's going to take just about one minute, maybe a minute and a half to finish. We often get asked questions about scalability of the software. You recall that in the previous example I was using over five million variants. Running this same filter there took a little bit longer. It scales about linearly. Um, we have found that we have very little problem handling data sets with 20 million or more columns. We have at times handled data sets substantially larger than that. Typically it seems that the only restraint is the um, speed and the size of your hard drive. Some of these functions do require lots of read-write time, but um, we've not found an upper limit really to the size of the data we can handle. Okay, so it finished and it found that about 107,000 of my variant sites were common based on dbSNP. So what I will do then, it also gives me this report notice that, um, excuse me, it tells me exactly which of the variants were found in the track with some additional information about them coming from the dbSNP database. Now that I have this, I can subset once again to just the columns that are remaining active. So I'm only seeing those in my spreadsheet, so I'm just taking a subset view here. I can apply now a second filter, another probe track membership, to identify the SNPs that are common based on 1,000 genomes. Select my 1,000 genomes all sites track. And again, this time I'm going to do a little bit differently because this track contains not only common variants but all variants. I'm not going to filter anything. I'm just going to ask for the report. So we'll go ahead and let this run. It'll go a little faster this time because um, we only have about half as many variant sites that need to be interrogated. And when we're done, we'll be left with a set of variants that we can be quite confident to be very rare in the broader population, or at least rare as defined by a 1% frequency. Now when this gets done, I will get a report similar to what I got with the dbSNP filter. And that report will include the minor allele frequency as, or actually the alternate allele frequency as reported by 1000 genomes. And I can use that report then to inactivate the common variants from my larger spreadsheet here. Okay, so it just finished told me that it found the majority of these in the probe track. But what we have now is this report that tells me which ones were found in the track, the alleles present, whether or not they match with what I've observed on the reference in the alternate, and this alternate allele frequency. What I want to do is activate only the rows of this spreadsheet where the, the alternate allele frequency is greater than... 0.01. Click OK. And I will do a row subset of this, and I'm going to rename this spreadsheet so I don't forget what it is. I'm just going to call it common vars 1kg for 1000 genomes. Close this down. And back here in my spreadsheet where I ran that from, I then can go to my select menu, activate or inactivate based on a second spreadsheet. I'm going to take the columns of my current spreadsheet, make them inactive if they are in that common variance list. Go ahead and run OK. All right, and so now 
I'm taken down to... Oh, I think I might have done that backwards. I should have... I might need to invert that. Now we'll go ahead and leave it for now. So I've removed the remaining ones. I think I did that right. Okay. I've removed the remaining variants that appear to be common based on the 1,000 genomes. So now I'll go ahead and rename this spreadsheet as well so I remember where I am. So I'm down to rare variants only. Now the next step that we had followed in the in the other workflow was to run variant classifications. Let's go ahead and do that right now. So from the analysis menu, I can take this variant classification tool and it needs some information. It needs me to identify a gene track. I believe by default it is using the same RefSeq track that I had used previously, but I'll go ahead and specify it to make sure. Then um, I need to identify my reference sequence track, and I'll leave all of the other variables on their default settings and go ahead and let this run. So this also will take just a few moments. There are several steps involved. It first needs to read through the markers in my spreadsheet and make a catalog of those. Then it will need to read through my gene track and identify all of the exons and all of the codons and the starts and stops and then we'll compare that to all of my variants to give them a classification based on those same categories that I walked you through with the other data set. But overall it shouldn't take more than two or three minutes with this particular data set. Now, one um, thing that I could have done here is I could have used a gene track and a, a sequence annotation track that only represented chromosome 19. That would have made this run quite a bit faster. I am using the whole genome annotation tracks here, so it is loading all of the necessary information for the whole genome, even though I only have one chromosome represented. Okay, so once it gets that information loaded, the rest goes quite quickly. And when it's done, it will give me several output spreadsheets. So um, it does point out that there are a few of the transcripts in my gene track that are invalid because they're not divisible by three or the start codon isn't correct. That's going to be more a problem with the public annotations than with the software. Unfortunately, the public annotations are not perfect. But we can look at our overall variant classifications here, get a sense of what we have among the rare variants in our data set. We can see that, um, again, there are only 3,834 that are coding. We did have this subset only to the variants that were with either in a gene or within a thousand base pairs, so there's not as many intergenic, but still a lot of them are intronic. We can move on to our coding variant classification. One thing I didn't point out last time is the extent of the annotations that are given. I pointed out just the classification column before, but notice we also have the C dot P dot notations that tell you the details about the observed variant both in genomic space as well as in protein space and where there are variants affecting multiple transcripts of the gene, there are additional columns out here that will tell you what the effect is on the other transcripts. So we can also, as before, look at our classifications and find out what our coding variants are consisting of. And notice we have, again, the majority being synonymous or non-synonymous. There are also some of these other 
types of variants like frame shifts, insertions, deletions, and substitutions. So as I did before, I'm going to activate by category, and I'm only going to activate the non-synonymous variants and these other things that are not in the unknown or synonymous categories. And again, I'll rename this so I don't forget what it is. This is the non-synonymous only. And then we'll go back to our marker spreadsheet we ran it from. Activate or inactivate, so set the columns to be active if they are in one of those rows of the non-synonymous only. Okay, now I'm left with um, just these few thousand variant sites that are going to be considered to be non-synonymous. They're um, going to be potentially damaging to the protein product. Now at this point I could do an additional functional annotation filter, perhaps get the SIFT annotations for the remaining variants. I also could have, of course, gotten the SIFT annotations for all of the variants and perhaps used some combination of the various methods to decide which variants I wanted to keep for analysis. Ultimately, we've designed the tool to be extremely flexible and allow you to apply any filters you would like and to use any workflows you would like as you go along. But at this point, I will take these 2300 variants I have remaining and I want to join them with a phenotype and do a rare variant collapsing test. So I can join this spreadsheet with another. I have this phenotype spreadsheet up at the top. Click OK. I'll join on the row labels. Keep my, I'll drop on matched rows. There shouldn't be any. And save it at the project root level. Okay, so now I have a joint spreadsheet where I have a few columns of phenotypic data together with my 2300 remaining variants. So for a phenotype for this test, we'll use something very simple, perhaps not very practical, but this is a column that identifies European versus non-European individuals. And we will take a look at our rare non-synonymous variants and determine whether there are any genes that collectively have variants that are associated with this phenotype. So from my analysis menu, I can go to collapsing methods. Now notice here, we have a few different collapsing tests available for rare variants. If you hold the mouse over them, you'll get a description of what they do. Uh, the one I'd like to do today is this KBAC test, kernel-based adaptive clustering, with permutation testing. There's also an option to use it with a regression test that would allow you to adjust for other covariates. But we will go ahead and keep default settings here. I'll increase the number of permutations slightly, and turn on adaptive permutation testing so it will go faster. Um, One-sided outputs, keep everything else here default, make sure I've got the right gene track selected. Okay, for form, we'll do one test per gene. You could also do one test per transcript if you wanted. I'm not going to impute wild type for missing values. Uh, I chose that last value because with the complete genomics data, they have tried to be very careful to always give a variant call whenever possible. So if you have a no call coming out of the complete genomics data, it normally means that they could not determine exactly what it is, and so I like to leave them missing. With some of the other um, platforms, often if it's missing, you can just assume reference. Okay, so that finished up, and what we have now is an output with results for, looks like 913 genes. We have gene names, we have p-values, we have... Um, more information about the KBAC test and some of the parameters that went into it for each gene. But let's take a look at our p-values. So I can do a minus log 10 p-value plot. So this would be similar to a Manhattan plot in the GWAS land. Now, 
This was a permutation-based test using 10,000 permutations, so a p-value of 10 to the minus 4th is the most significant possible, and it looks like several of the genes did max out on that. What I'd like to do here is add a, another graph that would be a variant map of the variants that went into the test. Sorry, I selected the wrong spreadsheet there. I want this one. So add a variant map. Okay. So at this point, we can begin to do some more interactive analysis. I'll also add another annotation track. I can add, for example, my reference sequence track, and we'll leave it at that for now. Okay, there. It draws in my reference sequence appropriately. So we see this is one of our top p-values. Um, it's in the region of this gene here in red. The p-value is drawn at the beginning of the gene. I can also add a grouping variable so we can see where our cases and controls are. So we can see now that for this particular gene, there is a single variant that is quite common in our Europeans that doesn't appear at all in the non-Europeans. There is one other variant out here that one subject has. So this maybe isn't the best example of the KBAC. The KBAC test will also identify more complex patterns than just a single um, variant there. It is designed to collapse multiple markers across a gene. But um, <clears throat> given the simplicity of this example, perhaps that's the best we could hope to find. So this gives you just a very simple, quick overview of some of the tools that are available in the software. And the, hopefully you get a sense of the flexibility and the power of some of these tools as well. So this concludes my presentation for today.